Well, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. I'm Pastor Bob. It is good to have you here. Uh, just something that we didn't announce earlier on. If you're visiting, you want to communicate with us, you're new. If you have a, you can go on our website and communicate, but if you have a smartphone, there is a barcode or a scan code on a seat back somewhere close to you. If you just hold it up, it'll take you to the appropriate spot. And we'd love to hear from you and respond to you. So uh, there's that. Let's pray together and we'll get to work. Lord, it's good this morning to take some time. Uh, it's been fun already to uh, sing together, to proclaim truth about your name, to see one another, to be in your house, to hear uh, scripture and the Advent candle, and to pray for some of our partners that are overseas. And Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, we ask that your spirit would just take it to our hearts. As we come in from worlds where there's all kinds of cares and concern, uh, I don't know what everybody's facing, but I know some of the issues. Lord, today, would you just meet people where they're at? Pray that you would renew their hope in you, that you, they would be restored in you, that through the process of taking communion together, Lord, uh, we would be filled and fed. And that, Lord, we'd go to the exact same circumstances with a trust in you and a confidence that we didn't come in with. So meet with us this morning, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. It's so good to have you here. Uh, we are going to preach through some of the Advent themes as we come into Christmas and uh, take a little break in our B series. Uh, I, I put it in the same uh, slide, but it, I just called it B in the love of God because today our candle was a love candle. Yeah, anybody finding December a busy season? Have my calendar out yesterday and uh, going through uh, what days I have and evenings I'm booked and where, where, where we need to be and what needs to happen. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's so much to do between now and when we celebrate on the 25th. Um, as I started trying to figure out how I was going to cram it all in and, and look at it all, of course, you sit because you think, well, I should sit quietly and do this, right? That's called procrastination. Anybody else have that? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, as you sit and you schedule yourself and you realize that you are hopelessly overwhelmed with everything, uh, I become aware that it's hard to find moments to slow down and appreciate the season. I mean, even when family arrives and even when we get to that moment, uh, there's going to be food to make. There's games to play. Anybody else have puzzles to put together? Some of you. Uh, you all have your traditions. Some of you will be off skiing, doing your thing. You want to play outside? There, there'll sh for sure be some shinny hockey games somewhere, I would imagine. And the time to slow down and reflect on the season isn't there. So each week, we want to give us some space. We take some of the themes, and we want you to come in and say, uh, I'm going to take a deep breath, and for the next Oh, just a half hour or so. And reflect on these themes, how awesome they are, and how this affects me as I come into this Christmas season with this amazing story. I mean, we celebrate this incredible truth, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, it's easy to say quickly, we get really comfortable with it. But when you think of the almighty God of creation, and you think the one that spoke things into being, and... And the God who is over all, he's sovereign and he's all-knowing and all-powerful uh, with us. Like, have you met each other? Have you met me? It should inspire some awe. How do we restore in this season our wonder and our awe at this miraculous thing that we celebrate? Well, I, I think it's going to take some intentionality. Just some time set aside to ponder these amazing truths. And so don't let your mind go to, oh, I've heard this before, or, or yeah, yeah, I, okay, I, I know. But take a deep breath and ask the Holy Spirit to renew in you that wonder, that awe, as we walk through the themes of the season. You know, something happens when we remember and we, we reflect, right? First, it adjusts our perspective. We realize where perhaps the things that aren't supposed to be as important as we've made them have become that way. 
and it will affect our priorities and our practice and how we handle things going forward. So you with me? You're not going to fall asleep. You're going to be able to relax and still pay attention. Okay, here we go. At home, some of you are just like getting snuggled on the couch and wrapping your warm blankets around you. Stay with us. Uh, Today, it's the love of God. And so uh, we're going to a very familiar passage found in John chapter 3. But I think it's really important that we don't jump all the way ahead to the key verses that we want to talk about, but we talk about the setting. Don't you like to know a little bit about what's going on and what prompted Jesus to talk about this? The, the first three verses tell us some stuff. Let's read it together. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Uh, I will often refer to him as Nick, and I hope that's okay. But his full name is Nicodemus, and if he would rather be called that, he'll let me know when I get there. Uh, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, who is this Nicodemus? Well, he's a Pharisee. Now, this means that these guys were the uber-religious, and they'd made it to the top of the heap. Uh, What I understand is uh, they would probably have memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. And I mean, when you read through that, uh, you would go, that is a lot of memorization. This guy is well-versed in the arguments. He's He's part of the elite of the religious leadership. Secondly, we know this about him, that he was on the council of the Sanhedrin. But what are the Sanhedrin? Uh, Really simply put, as I understand it, and some of you scholars might correct me, but the Romans uh, were polytheistic and they had many gods and they knew how to, when when they were subjugating the world of the known time, uh, they knew how to deal with people that had all these different beliefs, but the monotheistic or the the Jewish, the Israelites, they, they had one God. And, and their whole system was different. And they're like, how in the world do we understand and rule and manage these people when they, when they have all of this? Uh, what we'll do is we'll create a, uh, a Sanhedrin. We'll, we'll make a deal with their religious leadership and their religious leadership will oversee a whole bunch of what they do and bring the rules and stuff around it. And so we know that Nicodemus is a a pretty powerful political player. He's pretty highly respected. So not only has he got his doctorate, his PhD, or his Pharisee, whatever, uh, he is a member of the Sanhedrin. And we also know that he's curious. We see him seeking out against the party line, this upstart Jesus. I mean, we know a few things about the Pharisees keeping, they keep coming to him and, and they, they keep trying to trip him up and they're, they're asking him questions they don't really want answers to, but they're looking for a way to discredit this movement that is following this man, Jesus. And, and they're, they're looking for a way to, to explain away what's happening. And instead of towing the party line, here we have this curious leader coming to Jesus and asking real legitimate questions. We know he's careful. He doesn't brace him up in front of everybody. He doesn't like, bring in the, like, you know what? I'm going to bring my posse and we're going to corner Jesus. We know he'll be here. And we've got some questions and we're going to demand some answers. Uh, we see him coming at night and we see him coming alone. And he asks a really authentic question. That there's a real struggle going on here. And he talks about what brings him to Jesus. What's bringing him there? What's motivating him? And he's, he really just says, it is so apparent that you are from God. He says, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, we know from other scriptures that as Jesus wandered around teaching in the different synagogues, as he moved from place to place, it, it, and all the miracles were happening that that people were astounded at his wisdom and marveled at his words. 
And he says, this kind of thing can only come if you come from God. And, and the signs were all over. He says, I've seen the signs. I know that you are a healer. I, I know that the stories are true and that they've been verified. It's not clickbait, whatever you want to take from that time in that space. It's not misinformation. It's not disinformation. People were literally set free. Demons were cast out. People who were physically dead came out of the grave. There is an evident power over the natural. This was undeniable. I know this. So what's bringing him? He can't reconcile the party line and what he knows Jesus to be. And he needs to ask this question. Jesus tells him you have to be born again. Verses three to seven, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Well, Jesus hones in on what Nicodemus finds an extremely difficult question. Born again. Hmm. This is a difficult issue because it challenges his foundational belief. I mean, he starts with physical, scientifically, this is impossible, right? I mean, you're not going to take a grown man and put him back in the womb. Like, this just can't happen. And Jesus says, no, no, you, you, you're missing it a little bit. But what's really going on as he starts to understand what Jesus is talking about is this. He's got a foundational belief that if I'm good enough, if I keep the law, if I'm moral and I'm sincere and I, I do all the right things, I qualify, right? Because their whole system was based on this. And, and doesn't that come into our worldview today? That if you're better than your neighbors or you're, or you're good enough or you check all the boxes and you say, what must I do to look like a good Christian or to be this disciple that everybody respects or how does this work? And this foundational issue that I can't control it, I can't earn it or deserve it is there. Surely God would accept me. If I've memorized the five books, I've proven myself as a Pharisee, I've made it to this position of leadership, I've, and what is this born again thing? And Jesus gives him a truth. He says, this is not something you can attain on your own. It's something that can only be provided for you. This new life comes from the spirit of God. And it's something God does. Well, the struggle for Nicodemus is it's just outside of his current perspective. It doesn't fit his worldview and everything he knows. Listen to what he says in verses 9 to 13. Nicodemus says to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the son of man. He says, Nicodemus, aren't you a teacher? Don't you know all these prophecies? I mean, God wasn't silent. He laid his plan out there. 
Haven't you seen the evidence? I mean, you've heard people and, and we tell you this is what's happening. And yet you're just, mm, I don't know if I can believe. It. How are you going to believe these things when you have the prophecies, the evidence, and the testimony? And yet you struggle with this belief. We come to the key part of our text. Really familiar to you. It's easy to just kind of repeat the words. But put it in context as Jesus comes to Nicodemus and says, uh, dude, you've got to get this. You know a lot about it, but you haven't experienced it. This is what God's up to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Well, let's start with the first part of that key answer to Nicodemus. God so loved the world. The whole of his creation, fallen, broken. I mean, you only have to go back through history and watch Uh, man's inhumanity to man and see all of the difficult things and go, are you kidding? God loves this. And yet in Genesis, he, he said it was good and he was pleased and he created it and he created mankind for a purpose in relationship with him. And so as you see God Emmanuel, God with us, as as we come to this Christmas season and we try and wrap our minds around the fact that the almighty, all-creating, all-powerful God thought enough of this world and of us to take on human form, I I don't want you to get sidetracked by thinking it was simply one act of love. And John fleshes it out a little bit more in 1 John, it says love is who God is. It says this in 1 John 4, 7 to 11, be loved. Now that's brothers, sisters, family of God, those of us who know. Let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. First John, John's saying uh, that love that when it's encountered, not that we love God, but God loved us. And when we encounter that love, that that's what he did for us in the exact condition we are in, when we accept that, when we believe that, it says new life has started, that that changes us, that something is different. It says that love was made manifest, the arrival of the Savior. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. Why? So that we may live. It's redeeming. It's taking what was lost and bringing it to found. It's taking what, what was gone and making it right. It says he was sent to be a propitiation for our sin. Who used that word this week, propitiation? Anybody? I did. But I was preparing for this and I read the passage. So it's not really fair. The idea of regaining position with God. Of it being set right, what was intended. That God in his love, God is love. The whole thing is about this. And now it says that love lives in us. That new life, the very character of God. 
and that it should be evident in who you are, especially in your relationships one to another. Oh yeah, First John fills it out. He says, for God so loved the world, going back to that, God not only acted in his love, God is love and continues to act out of that love. And that's who we become, that's who becomes, who we become a part of. That's the life that started in us. But it goes on in the conversation with Nicodemus to be really clear about the mission. Be easy to assume that God came to uh, point out some wrongs. No? Any of you like that? You, you go, into the, go into work after being gone for a little while and you, you want to point out the things that aren't done? Or you, you, you want to point out the wrongs? You know, you come in and you think God who created the whole thing comes along. He says, okay, that's messed up and that's messed up and that's messed up. And you stop it and you stop it and you stop it. It says he didn't come to condemn the world. Now, you need to know this because we sometimes believe that when the truth comes in condemnation, we're being loving. The goal was always a response unto salvation. They already stood condemned. See, they were already condemned. They were already without the resources to fix themselves. Apart from God initiating, nothing could happen. But the the mission was so clear. It wasn't to condemn, but it was to redeem. It was redemption. I love what somebody said about this, and I wish I could give this quote to who it's owed. But I, I wrote it down, and I forgot where I got it. So it's not mine. It's somebody else's. Uh, The redemption would be the release of people, animals, or property from bondage through the full payment of the price owed. In my mind, I went to like a pawn shop or whatever, and and, and you you exchanged that. Uh, It's probably a really imperfect, imperfect illustration. But just think about somebody coming along and paying a, a price that you couldn't pay to be redeemed, the release of from bondage from what you really did owe, from what you really did deserve. The Bible goes on to say he didn't come to condemn, but to make him a new creation. It talks about heart of stone becoming heart of flesh. It talks about the living spirit of God in us. It goes on in Romans to talk about how we're now justified and the little Bobism that I stole from somebody else, probably just as if I'd never sinned, Right? What does it look like that God looks down now on you as his creation and he doesn't see all your messed up with uh, messed upness. He doesn't see all your failures. He doesn't see where you blow it. He doesn't look at all the ways you don't measure up. He doesn't stand there playing whack-a-mole with you, but he, he sees you as justified because of what Christ did. Just as if I'd never sinned. Goes on to talk about being adopted sons and daughters. And I love this kind of picture that uh so parents how many of you are parents in the room let's i don't know put your hands up we've got some of you are just taking this relaxed thing really far okay as parents how many of you have ever been disappointed in your kids yeah so hands up everywhere right uh how many of you for that it meant you wanted to not love your kids anymore See, we, we tend to equate these two things that if God is disappointed with my choice or disappointed with me, it, it somehow affects his love or his approval of me. And it doesn't. He says, you're adopted as sons and daughters. You're citizens of another kingdom. You're part of the family of God. You're part of the body of Christ. You're redeemed, purchased with a price. You're a new creation. The old has passed away. The new is there. When Satan comes along and says, look at all the crud. In your, that's the old me, right? You're justified. You're adopted. Goes on. It says you have a full inheritance. It speaks of what's coming. That as sons and daughters of God, we're going to spend eternity fully secured with God. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. 
They said, it didn't come to condemn. I, I came to save. I came that this might be your reality. And it goes then into the struggle with belief. Right? Who believes in the name of shall be saved? Who doesn't believe stands condemned? Let's paint the two ditches. I love the picture of a gravel road. And now that it's snowy, all of you can relate to this. How many of you drive kind of some rural roads? And if you get too far over, have you ever felt your vehicles getting sucked into the ditch? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, and some of you have gone in and some of you have, have wildly swerved out of it and gave a Dukes of Hazard yell. And we're just like proud of your driving. Woo! Made it. Woo! It gets your heart rate up. There's two ditches here in this struggle with belief. Um, let me just, I'm going to take the time. Yeah, we're here now. Uh, <laughs> so culturally, there's been an interesting shift. It used to be that we didn't have to tell people about their sinfulness or that they didn't measure up. They, they just instinctively knew. And people that are real honest with themselves would probably come to that. Um, the generation that's post-Christian and that's further and further from understanding the biblical narrative uh, has grown up saying, uh, you're valuable because you're breathing and you're, you're valuable because you're a human. And, and we have people now who really struggle with this idea that I don't measure up. Of course I measure up. I'm here. And no one has a right to judge me, right? And, and so there's them. And so in the one ditch on one side, we have this extremism over here. And, and for the religious, it comes out like this. I'm better than everybody else. I'm not that bad. I don't feel like I'm that bad. You know, I, I just don't have this connection to my sin being that important. Because I've been, become real comfortable with the fact that I'm, I'm just forgiven. And so the struggle to believe comes with, I'm making an honest effort. I have great intentions. And like Nicodemus, for those who come out of a religious background, um, how could God not accept that? How could that not be enough? I mean, if he's fair, right? It, it just makes sense to me in my mind. I'm doing my best, so that got to be okay. For those who don't come from a religious background, they would say, uh, I'm not even sure God's moral. I have my own ideas. I grew up in a culture that's given me a bunch of values around uh, people's choices and how things should work and, and what a utopian society should look like. And so uh, the struggle with belief was, does this fit what I already have concluded or think in my mind? In both cases, they want to play God. They want to earn it, deserve it. They want it to fit their worldview. And so the struggle with belief comes to a point of rejection. Because to believe means you have to accept something you're not worthy of. And agree to follow someone, the living God, whose view is quite different than yours. That's in one ditch. On the other ditch, on this road of truth, as it were, some of you who are sitting here and saying, I've already blown it. I love what you're talking about. I like what he's saying to Nicodemus. Nick was a good guy. No wonder he told him that. But I know me and I know my heart and I know the things I've done. There's failures in your life that you've hidden or things that have happened that you're just deeply ashamed of. So this almighty God, this story of forgiven sin and, and that God loves, like so he just can't love me in the place I am. I can't even love myself. If he really knew about that choice that I made or that thing that haunts me, or the darkness of my heart. If he really knew what I thought, if he's all knowing, there's no way that that kind of love for me would cause the almighty God to do this. 
I'm disqualified simply by my sin or my mistakes. See, those are the two ditches we run in, right? And Satan loves to come along. What, what did we say the other week when we talked about him? He, he, he really wants to come along and discourage you. Plant the seed that this couldn't be for you, either for this reason or this reason. Did God really mean this? Is that just an interpretation? Well, surely we can find another opinion that validates you. And, and then not only does he want to discourage you from faithful following, but then he wants to deceive you, supplant it with some lies, some things to take you 10, 15 degrees off. It's not a full on, yeah, you should stab people to death, but it's a, they deserve maybe to die. And, and then ultimately wants to destroy you, wants you to step on the, snap, on the trap and snap it shut. And in both of these, as you try and walk down this road of belief where it says God didn't come to condemn and he, he came out of love and this was his plan and this is how we respond and this is the road to salvation, those two ditches, man, they're soft shoulders. And the simple truth is that if we believe, we can accept. And it's a choice and an action we take. Romans says it like this. Paul puts it pretty clearly in Romans 10, verses 9 and 11. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. My favorite question. So what? Yeah. Okay, we've learned about Nick. And we've seen this clear answer. And we've bounced around to some other stuff that John said and Paul said. Um, we're going to have communion and sing a little, and then we got to go. What do I do with this today as we come into Christmas? Don't miss this. God is love. First John says it clearly. It's not one act of love. This is who he is. The whole plan is motivated by that. He's not come to whack-a-mole or to... Uh, condemn you. He's not come to make you feel more and more guilty or worse and worse. In fact, he gave you his spirit to teach you and to equip you. And he initiated this. It was part of his plan. And in a broken, messed up world, he orchestrated and moved the pieces that the almighty God, that he would give his son. For he so loved the world, he sent, sent his son. And I love that it's just so clear this was the plan that he, is, he initiated, and the evidence is super, super clear. This is God's plan of redemption. He's made it known, and he's invited you to respond to it. Secondly, our struggle is real, so let's not pretend, okay? It's not as simple as praying a prayer. You really have to come to the conviction and belief in your heart and surrender your life and put them in the right place. You know, Romans 1 says the evidence is all around us. In creation, in the study of science, and how things are made, it's pretty clear that there was an intelligent design, a creator. I mean, we come up with all kinds of other ideas and options, but there's evidence all around us. And in fact, if you take a minute and you turn the noise down and you reflect, you have to admit that we're not only physical, I mean, we're here, touch yourself appropriately. Um, we're, we're emotional. And you're laughing. Some of you are crying. Some of you at home are going, I can't believe you just said that. If you're not disappointed with me yet, hang tight. I've, I've got some time. I will disappoint you. We're physical, we're emotional, and we're spiritual. Now, we like to ignore that one. And to pretend that as long as we look after the physical, emotional, we're okay. But if you stop and reflect for a minute, the evidence is all around us that we are created for a relationship with our creator. We have a God-sized hole in us. 
Many of us are trying to fill it with stuff, with relationships. Many of us are trying to quiet it by just keeping the noise high, right? Just keep busy, keep pushing, keep going, keep looking for the new experience, keep looking for the next thing. Don't be at peace. <laughs> don't rest. Don't think about it. But it's clear. Our struggle is real. This morning, for some of you, as you hear this message, you're asking this question, can I accept this truth? Because it challenges my cultural perspective. You're Nicodemus coming to it. Some of you from a religious background or an upbringing. And some of you from, you've been so indoctrinated in the culture. Like, I'm not even sure God fits my morality. Like, you get to form it and he has to fit. But can I believe this? Can I come to the end of myself in the place of saying, I can't deny the evidence. And so spiritually, something has to happen. I know I can't do enough. And then for some of you, the struggle this morning is, can I truly believe it for me? Knowing what I know, all the things that I walk around with that shame me and that bring guilt and accusation in my heart? Can I truly come to the place of understanding that my sin is removed as far as the east is from the west, that the love of God compelled him to be born a baby, to evidence his divinity and humanity and to go willingly to a cross? I mean, it says he went because he loved you and wanted to, that he rose, that death is defeated, that God has provided a way. Can I really forgive myself? Can I really have God forgive me and accept it? See, the amazing truth is when, when we get there, we should stand in awe this Christmas. That God's love was manifest for us in this. And the invitation today is to simply accept that and to follow. And Romans was really clear. Today, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you can begin this journey of a relationship with the Almighty God. Some of you started on the journey, and man, the last two years have been tough, and, and, and all of these other things have come along, and you've begun to doubt the love of God, and doubt that this is the plan, and you've begun to not only condemn yourself, but walk in this defeated struggle that you have. And today, you need to be reminded that you are adopted. You can disappoint him, but it doesn't change his love that you're redeemed at an incredible price, that eternity is secured. And the invitation of God this morning is to come and worship the God who loves and saves. It leads us to communion. Some simple elements. Jesus, knowing that... Uh, not only do we get older as humans and we forget, but we're a forgetful bunch <laughs> and need reminders, uh, instituted something. He's with his disciples in the upper room and he knows what's coming. And he takes and he breaks bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat. Now, if you have come to the church moment of decision, even if it was this morning, and you've confessed, Lord, I need this. I believe I want you to come into my life. And a new life is starting. You. This, this is for you. Because you get to celebrate God's manifest love, that he would send his son, that he would choose to go in your place, that he would make payment, that, that propitiation would happen. And that you would be able to have the very living spirit of God in you. That he would see you with your sins removed as far as the east is from the west. And so if you're a Christian, we invite you to join us. This has nothing to do with our denomination. It has everything to do with us being brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'll say this. Paul does say, be careful. Like If you have something in your life that you know you really need to deal with, Go deal with it. Because if this is the love you've partaken of, how in the world can that be in you? And you hold on to hatred. 
So Jesus says, here's this great symbolic reminder, this, this thing you can do. This is my body broken for you. And can I be honest? We've gone to these little cups with this. This is not bread. I don't know what this is. Uh, but symbolically, I understand what it represents. He says, uh, and every time you remember God's love manifests like this, do this together in remembrance. Let's partake. Father, I'm thankful today. Thankful for a quiet spot to remember. Renewed in my awe that For people like us, you would go to this length. And so, Father, as we walk through this, continue to do the healing and restoring work in people's lives that you wish to do. The same way he took the cup, said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. I love this idea of covenant relationship. Probably the closest we have to it is this marriage contract with implied benefits and consequences and kind of meant to bind us together. But he said, it's this covenant, right? And God is faithful to his covenant even when we're not. This is new covenant. And, and he says, as, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember this. God's love manifests what he did for you until as we look forward to his promise of returning for his church of us being together again until he comes. Let's partake together. So Lord, today we are now going to uh, offer our worship and our praise and respond to you. Uh, Pray that it would be pleasing in your sight and that you would continue to restore us here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, at the end of the service, after we're done singing, I'm going to give a benediction and there'll be a extended an offer. If any of you would like to come forward for anointing and prayer for healing or you have an issue you want somebody to pray with you about, um, we're going to do that because that's what we do as a family. We create spaces for that. And so uh, that's something for you to just know is coming. It's no pressure. It's not something. But if uh, you need someone, a brother or sister to pray with you and you need to be touched by God this morning, that invitation's here.